Okay, Exodus 34 and 35. Last week, we were at a pivotal moment in the story. God has entered into a covenant agreement with Israel, and Moses is up on Mount Sinai receiving the terms of that covenant agreement. He's up there for 40 days and 40 nights. But while he is up there, Israel is down below the mountain worshipping idols uh, under under the fickle leadership of Aaron, who, who has himself fashioned this golden calf for these people to worship. Um, and so Israel has broke their covenant agreement um, on the honeymoon, so to speak. Uh, 40 days haven't even passed since they said, all of these things we will obey, and they have broken it. Uh, we didn't get a chance last week to explore all that happened in chapter 33 because we ran out of time, uh, and there's so much there. So I'm going to start today by going over the, the interaction that begins in chapter 33 between God and Moses uh, before we take a closer look at chapters 34 and 35. Now, this conversation between God and Moses, this is um, amazing. There's so much richness in this. And I think that you understand this conversation best when you uh, put it up against the conversation between God and Moses that happened back back at the burning bush in chapters 3 and 4. Uh, they kind of parallel each other. And the stark difference that you'll notice is Moses has changed so much. Uh, when he was sheepish and fickle himself back in chapters 3 and 4 at the burning bush. Now he is bold and he calls on God uh, and he pleads with God uh, almost audaciously. So chapters 33, it begins with God saying to Moses, leave this place, leave Mount Sinai, and I'll deliver you into the promised land as I've promised to do. But God says, I will not go with you. Uh, I'll send my angel ahead of you, but I will not go with you. And he says that this is because you are a stiff-necked people. Remember, the stiff-neckedness, it's, it's, it's linked to their idolatry, their worship of idols, who are also stiff-necked. And God says that if I go with you, you stiff-necked people, uh, I might destroy you. And Moses responds by asking God to remember that this nation is his people, uh, that God... Um, Going with his people is what will distinguish them from all the other people on the face of the earth. So, so Moses calls on God and says, remember uh, the promise that you made back in chapter 3. Uh, Moses asked the burning bush, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? And God replies, I will be with you. Moses relies on that truth. And so he pleads with God to be with him and to be with the Israelites. And God's reply is, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And so God listens to the intercession of Moses. And then Moses says, now, show me your glory. And we get this unique story, uh, this interesting story, about God passing in front of Moses. Now God instructs Moses to, to carve two stone tablets Again, just like the ones that he had carved before for the Ten Commandments. Remember the Ten Commandments that he broke? Um, but Moses is to carve them again, and he's to bring them up on Mount Sinai. And God says to Moses that when he's up on the mountain, God himself will pass in front of Moses. But Moses can't see God's face, because whoever sees his face cannot live. Uh, and so God says, I will put you in the cleft of a rock, and I'll cover the cleft with my hand as I pass by, so that Moses can only see the back of God. And that is what happens. Uh, like I said, it's an interesting, it's a unique, it's a strange story. Uh, it raises a lot of questions about whether God actually does have a hand and face and back. Um, I tend to think that this is probably anthropomorphisms. Uh, remember that God is spirit. Uh, it's not meant to be taken literally, um, but, but God does this for Moses. Um, and as, as he passes in front of Moses, um, God proclaims this famous truth about himself. Uh, it's actually what he says in verses 6 and 7 is the most quoted verse in the rest of the Bible. It says, the Lord, the Lord, or Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, 
and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. We've talked about these verses many times already. Uh, This is God saying who he is. Uh, And this is what the story of Exodus has showed us about God. This is who Yahweh is. He's slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And yet he doesn't leave guilty unpunished. Um, Moses, after hearing the proclamation, he falls down to worship God. And he says, Lord, if I have found favor in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. You know, God is a forgiving God, and so Moses pleads for his forgiveness. And the amazing part of this story is that God re-establishes the covenant with Israel. That's what happens next. So he, he rewrites on the stone tablets the commandments, and he reiterates some of the laws from earlier, uh, and he gives them all to Moses, and he says, I am going to enter a covenant with your people. And Moses again stays up there for 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, and when he comes down from the mountain, his face is shining. Uh, and the people are freaked out. Uh, and so Moses covers his face and then he unveils his face. But that's that's what we've got so far. That's what we've got for today. So how is this going to matter for us today? Uh, this Tuesday, this Torah Tuesday, why does this matter? Well, two things. Firstly, Moses intercedes for his people uh, and God listens. And Jesus intercedes for his people, and God listens. We, we are told uh, that God listens to Moses' intercession for his people because God is pleased with Moses. And when Jesus comes along in the Gospels, God announces from heaven, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And so the people had Moses with whom God was pleased. We, God's people, have Jesus with whom he is well pleased to intercede for us. Um, the writer of Hebrews picks up on this idea and says that well, Jesus is, is greater than Moses and he lives to intercede for us. We have this wonderful advocate in the heavens, in Jesus, who intercedes for us because we are still a sinful people um, and we need that intercession. And the other thing for today is about the radiance of Moses' face. It's a bit of a strange thing in the story, uh, but it communicates that You cannot engage with God and leave unchanged. His presence in our lives changes us. Uh, Paul picks up on this theme in in his letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, We all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. And so our encounter with God's glory has mean, means that it transforms us into the image of Jesus. When we are with God, he changes us. And so let's spend time with God and be changed for better. Bye.